Hello, welcome to this course on the dynamics of classical and quantum fields. My name is Professor Girish Setlur. I am Professor of Physics in IIT Gahati and I want to take you into this journey of uh, the theory of quantum and classical fields. So, I am going to be telling you in detail uh, what fields are, whether they are quantum or classical and how they differ from uh, point particles. So, um, I am going to be basing this uh, course on the textbook that I have authored. It is published by CRC Press, so you can see the display here. So, um, so this is the title page of the book. It says Dynamics of Classical and Quantum Fields and Introduction and my name is there and the uh, publisher is CRC Press which is a part of Taylor and Francis. So, um, if you go in, into this book, you will see uh, some publisher details here. If you wish to purchase a copy of this book, uh, you can uh, or if you want to recommend this book to your library, you will see certain uh, publisher details here. So, the ISBN number is listed here which you can uh, have a look at. Okay, so, um, so I am going to uh, briefly display to you the contents of uh, this book. So, the course that I am teaching now which is Dynamics of Classical and Quantum Fields which is an introductory course to uh, classical and quantum field theory, uh, but also keep in mind that this uh, course is being taught uh, from a perspective of non-relativistic uh, physics. So, it is not relativistic quantum field theory the way it was originally developed, but rather it is later avatars uh, which are more applicable to fields like condensed matter physics and so on. So, of course, I will be also mentioning uh, uh, in passing uh, relativistic quantum fields as well. So, the contents of this course uh, are as follows. Uh, so, I am going to be uh, reviewing. So, uh, if you can see this list of contents, you will see that uh, it has several chapters. So, the first chapter is all about uh, the notion of field, you know how it differs from a point particle. So, I am going to be starting with a review of Lagrangian mechanics and then I am going to discuss the Hamiltonian counterpart of the Lagrangian formalism which uh, you all should know and it is sort of a prerequisite for this course that you should be aware of elementary classical and quantum physics. So, uh, Hamiltonian formalism is obtained by a Legendre transformation of the Lagrangian formalism. So, then I am going to be discussing the role of symmetries and conservation laws and specifically the very famous Noether's theorem which tells you that whenever there are continuous symmetries it leads to a conservation law. And then uh, I am going to be uh, also discussing in the same chapter some variational methods, the famous Brachistochron problem which uh, tells you the shortest time, what is the path on which uh, point particle has to travel in order to reach uh, an elevator uh, a point that is uh, starting from a point that is under an elevation to a point that is lower down. So, that um, what is the path it has to take in order to minimize the time taken. So, that is the famous Brachistochron problem which uh, requires, uh, so that is the starting point of variational calculus historically speaking. So, I am going to be discussing that and the uh, Fermat's principle in optics uh, also can be recast as a variational problem which I am going to discuss. And then the least square fit which is typically used in your laboratory courses uh, is also actually a variational um, problem which uh, when, uh, uh, when addressed gives you the least square prescription for finding the you know the best straight line that passes through a bunch of points. Okay, so in the earlier chapter I am not going to discuss Noether's theorem because it is reserved for the second chapter, but the flows and symmetries in the first chapter refers to basically the uh, basically it sets the groundwork for the second chapter which is Noether's theorem. 
Okay, so I am going to describe in very great detail the Noether's theorem in various uh, situation and then uh, the third chapter is going to be more specific. So, I am going to start discussing the electromagnetic field and uh, the stress energy tensor is going to be introduced of the electromagnetic field. So, I am going to tell you that uh, the electromagnetic field is characterized by not a vector, but a two component object, it is more like a matrix and uh, all the various components will have various meanings. So, I am going to describe to you the relations between the fields and the stress energy tensor, which are basically uh, quadratic in the fields. Okay. So, um, so I am going to uh, impress upon you the relativistic nature of the electromagnetic field and I am going to describe in great detail uh, how you can infer that the electromagnetic field as described by Maxwell's theory is actually uh, consistent with special relativity rather than uh, Galilean relativity. So, I am going to uh, also uh, describe uh, the role of gauge invariance and so on. So, uh, so then I am going to briefly touch upon the solutions of Maxwell's equations in specific situations like Gauss's law and electrostatic or uh, more sophisticated example would be the motion of a relativistic uh, charged particle which will mean that you have to invoke what are called Leonard Weakert potentials to describe the electromagnetic field produced by charged particle that is accelerating in an arbitrary way. So, uh, then I am going to also uh, explain to you that the uh, diffraction theory can be actually uh, derived using electromagnetic theory. Okay. So, uh, and that is seldom done in many optics courses. So, in optics courses people uh, you know this they kind of specialize into uh, geometric optics or physical optics and they go the historical route. So, I am going to uh, go the logical route where I will use Maxwell's theory and actually derive uh, all those uh, earlier historical uh, developments which come across as approximations, sometimes very crude approximations to the actual uh, real answer. Okay. So, then in chapter 4, I am going to be describing uh, elasticity theory and fluid mechanics. So, they go together because uh, many of the concepts uh, of uh, stress and strain are also applicable to fluids. So, so, I am going to be describing the notion of stress and strain in deformable objects and then we will quickly move over to fluids where similar considerations allow us to describe fluids in terms of uh, Euler equations and when there is viscosity in the fluid, it becomes Navier-Stokes equation. So, then as special cases, I am going to be discussing the Bernoulli principle which is uh, very famous and known to all school children, but then it comes across as a special case of this more general approach to fluids. And then uh, the hardest uh, aspect of fluids which is turbulence is just briefly mentioned then we will make some effort to uh, describe turbulence quantitatively. It is an active topic of research and it is it's impossible to do any justice to that subject in this course, but I am just going to mention a little bit of it. Okay, uh, so, until chapter 4 including chapter 4, I will be discussing only classical fields, so uh, the theory of classical fields. So, then I am going to motivate the transition to quantum fields through chapter 5, which is by displaying certain solutions of Schrodinger equations and the relativistic counterpart of Schrodinger equation namely Dirac and Klein Gordon equations. So, then uh, that will motivate uh, in a certain proper way, I am going to motivate how that those solutions indicate 
that the real uh, description of relativistic system should be in terms of fields rather than point particles. So, in chapter 6, uh, I am going to describe the mathematical tools that are going to be necessary to describe fields, uh, quantum fields specifically in a proper way. And those mathematical tools are called functional integrations and integration over spaces of functions. So, normally uh, all of us are familiar with integrations of uh, you know functions where the independent variable is a real number. So, you typically write uh, integral f of x dx where x is a real number. But uh, functional integration is a situation where that x actually is not a real number but is itself a function and so in other words you are adding up see after all what is in integration is just limit of a sum. So, you are just uh, discretizing the x values and adding them all up and making sure though as x values are very close to each other. So, whereas the uh, idea of functional integration is that you are going to uh, write f of some function say g and then you are adding up all the g. So, in, you are integrating over g, but g itself is a function. So, you are integrating over all possible functions. So, in other words that function could be sin, cos, log. So, a whole bunch of possibilities there are a mind boggling number of possibilities, but functional integration implies that you should be able to integrate over all of them and uh, those types of notions are really needed uh, in order to uh, fully understand quantum fields. So, I am going to describe to you the mathematical uh, details of functional integration and uh, I am also going to impress upon you that there are certain situations where those functional integrals just like ordinary integrations can be done exactly under some situations and only approximately in others. Yes, even in functional integrals a very small handful of uh, examples can be done exactly, the others have to uh, rely on approximations such as uh, the familiar perturbation theory in which is analogous, uh, the analogous use of perturbation theory which is familiar from uh, elementary quantum mechanics. So, uh, so then I am going to in chapter 7, uh, even though strictly speaking it is not uh, part of quantum field theory, but then uh, many uh, quantum mechanics textbooks uh, leave the reader with the impression that uh, quantum mechanics is uh, can only be studied using the Hamiltonian formalism of its classical counterpart which is classical mechanics. Uh, whereas, uh, the Lagrangian approach to quantum mechanics is completely ignored and that is the idea originally thought of by Dirac and developed by Feynman and it is called the path integral formalism of quantum mechanics and I am going to be describing in significant detail even though it is uh, about point particles. So, that it is the quantum mechanics of point particles described using Lagrangians rather than Hamiltonians. So, I, I included this chapter here because this aspect is absent in many treatments of quantum mechanics. So, I felt that I have to squeeze this in here even though this is strictly not part of quantum field theory. So, um, having done that, then I am going to describe to you uh, how it is possible to study systems where the number of particles are not fixed. So, where you can create and annihilate particles. So, you can have a, a situation where like in if you have a box of photons, photons can disappear, appear because they are just quanta of energy and uh, it is possible to describe uh, systems with variable number of particles using the idea of creation and annihilation operators of quantum particles be they uh, bosons or be they fermions. Uh, so, I am going to be describing uh, those ideas in significant detail in chapter 8. Then. Uh, in chapter 9, I am going to 
uh, focus on uh, the condensed matter applications where I am going to uh, describe the motion of electrons hopping where electrons are not really freely, uh, they are free to move, they are not free to move but rather they are tightly bound to uh, a certain atom uh, and each atom sits on a uh, very fixed lattice point in a solid and then each of those electrons occasionally hop to their neighbors which leads to uh, the notion of chemical bond. So that is the uh, famous uh, and very useful tight binding approach to uh, studying solids. So I am going to be describing the quantum field aspects of the tight binding approach to solid in significant detail. So um, and then later on in chapter 10 I am going to be describing the idea of Green's function and why it is useful in many body physics. So, so, I'm going, so by chapter 10 we will be uh, deep into the condensed matter version of quantum field theory where we will be discussing non-relativistic quantum particles uh, in systems where the number is not conserved and then we will we'll be studying the idea of Green's function. So the idea of Green's function is that you have a system of say n fermions and then at a given time you remove a fermion and then that whole system gets disturbed because you have removed a fermion and uh, the system evolves in, in a very non-stationary way and then you again return that fermion back to the system after a, after a period of time and then the system is no longer what it was earlier and then you can compute what is called the quantum mechanical overlap. Basically you find the quantum mechanical overlap between the wave functions uh, before you remove the fermion and after you put it back in and that quantum mechanical overlap is what is called the Green's function of the system. So I am going to be describing to you uh, ways of calculating this important quantity and why it is important and so on. So if time permits I will do uh, chapter 11, 12 and 13 uh, which is uh, chapter 13 is uh, something that uh, as part of my own research so I probably will not be able to cover that because it is still ongoing it is uh, a lot of new developments have taken place since this book was published so I am um, not going to touch chapter 13 but chapter 11 is about coherent states and uh, um, you know a description of coherent states and how uh, it can be um, incorporated to do path integrals. So uh, chapter 12 is also as a more research kind of flavor rather than standard pedagogy so I may or may not be able to reach to chapter 12. So whatever it is uh, the main purpose of offering this course is because I want to I want younger people uh, especially you know very bright motivated advanced BSE level or bachelor's level students who are interested in pursuing a higher degree in physics especially theoretical physics to uh, quickly reach a stage where they can appreciate uh, important research developments uh, earlier. Uh, so I felt that this uh, such a book would be very beneficial because it uh, starts with things that they already know which is Lagrangian and Hamiltonian point particle mechanics and quickly ramps up to a stage where they can appreciate uh, modern condensed matter ideas. So, uh, so the learning curve is quite steep but then uh, this book attempts to make that somewhat easy by uh, you know taking the student through uh, a logical sequence of chapters which culminate in the uh, description of uh, quantum mechanical particles in a condensed matter system. So I hope uh, many students uh, will be interested in registering for this course 
and will not uh, feel intimidated by this uh, rather vast, seemingly vast syllabus. So, uh, of course, uh, because of the nature of this course, it is not going to be easy for me to uh, test uh, your understanding. So, you have to cooperate by actually understanding this uh, material and uh, ask uh, during the interactive sessions that are going to be uh, advertised. So, so during live interactions, you can ask me any doubts you have about the course and the syllabus. So, that, that's going to be extremely critical in an advanced course like this where uh, you have to participate in order to uh, gain full benefit from this course. So, uh, I hope uh, I have interested you to register for this course and uh, I hope to see you for the first lecture. Thank you. Mm -hmm.